Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We're very excited about this presentation. Uh, we're honored to have Dr. Rachel Licker from the Union of Concerned Scientists to uh, present to us some very incredible information because the reality is that it is hot outside. <laughs> My name is Natalia Ortiz. I'm the Director of Development and I'm hosting uh, this webinar from sunny Miami, Florida. Uh, and it is incredibly hot outside. We are seeing heat advisories all the time from our, our local weather station. And I don't know where all of our participants are from, but I'd be happy if you would share some of the locations where you're at. Uh, while we get started with Dr. Licker, I'm going to stop sharing uh, and allow Dr. Licker to start. And feel free to let us know where, where you're joining us from while Dr. Licker starts sharing her screen. Tallahassee, Miami. Feels like 105 in Chicago, Nashville, Massachusetts. Louisville, welcome. So excited to see people from all over the US, Pompano, Palm Beach. Well, thank you for, for, for joining us today and I'll let Dr. Rachel Licker take it away. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so yes, I'm Rachel Licker. I'm a senior climate scientist with the Union of Concerned Scientists. I am joining you from Madison, Wisconsin, where it is very hot and humid as well. <laughs> Not known for our heat up here, but it actually does get quite brutal. Um, and it's a long summer of heat and uh, air advisory alerts from all the wildfire smoke that's been coming in from Canada and out west. So um, I was uh, hoping to speak with you today about a new report that we released um, this month called Too Hot to Work, Assessing the Threats climate change poses to outdoor workers. Um, this is work that I uh, did in collaboration with my colleague, Christy Dahl at UCS. Um, we also collaborated with Professor John Abatzoglu from UC Merced uh, for a peer review study that is um, underlying this report and many, many colleagues, some of whom are on the call like Alicia Race who um, have helped to do outreach and work on the Hill to get this report out there. So thank you to all. Really excited to be joining Cleo and I'm so grateful for all of your time today to, to talk through this. So, um, what did we do? Well, in 2019, we conducted an analysis called Killer Heat, in which we looked at how extreme heat is likely to change across the United States as a result of global warming this century. And what we found is that between now and mid-century, the number of days with a heat index above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and the heat index is the feels like temperature, a combination of heat and humidity, which I know you are all very familiar with, <laughs> um, we found that the number of days in which the heat index um, would be above 100 degrees Fahrenheit in an average year at mid-century would double um, over historical values, and the number of days above 105 degrees Fahrenheit would quadruple if we were to fail to take aggressive action to reduce heat trapping emissions. And so what we wanted to do is really understand the implication of those increases in extreme heat for one of the most exposed populations, and that's outdoor workers. So what you're looking at here are maps from that killer heat study. On the left are historical values of the number of days in which the heat index exceeded 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, on the top and 105 degrees on the bottom. Um, the values range from in white zero to one all the way up to red being uh, greater than 100 to 200 days in an average year. Um, at mid-century with again no action on climate change you see the values for those 100 and 105 degree days across the country and you can see Florida is really one of the most at-risk areas in terms of increases in dangerous heat. And so we want, why we wanted to focus on outdoor workers is because they're a population that's both essential and highly exposed to extreme heat. So when we talk about outdoor workers, we're talking about the people who pick our food, who build our homes, who respond to emergencies, and they're often considered essential 
and yet they're often put in a position of having to choose between their health and a paycheck. Um, and because there are no mandatory protections in place to keep workers safe in the face of extreme heat at the federal level and in most states except Washington and California, we really saw the need for an analysis that could help shed light on this issue. Um, there are currently about 32 million outdoor workers across the lower 48 states. Um, so that's about one in every five adults in the civilian workforce. Um, and we found that outdoor workers disproportionately, actually I said lower 48 states, actually I believe that's actually all 50 states and Puerto Rico, sorry. <laughs> uh, and we found that outdoor workers disproportionately identify as um, Hispanic and Latino, Black or African American um, in many occupations. And research has shown that outdoor workers in the US have up to 35 times higher risk of dying because of heat exposure. And we know that those risks are not distributed equally. Um, research has shown that individuals identifying as Hispanic have a higher chance of dying on the job because of extreme heat exposure because of several factors, including language barriers and disproportionately low access to quality health care, as well as for those who may be undocumented, a fear of legal repercussions should they raise red flags on the job. And so what did we do? Well, first of all, we started with that killer heat data that I mentioned. Um, so we started with uh, the data that gives us information on the frequency of days with a heat index above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and we looked at these numbers at historical, mid-century and late century timeframes for three different global warming scenarios. Um, we looked at the number of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit for uh, what we refer to as a no action scenario in which heat trapping emissions continue up through to the end of the century. Um, we looked at a slow action scenario in which heat trapping emissions start to decline around mid-century. And we looked at a rapid action scenario in which heat trapping emissions start to drop immediately and we are able to meet the Paris Climate Agreement goal of keeping warming to two degrees Celsius um, above pre-industrial levels. And so what we then did um, was we applied the recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control um, and their National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety or NIOSH on how to reduce work time on hot days. And that let us calculate the number of workdays that could become unsafe and which could be at risk of being lost due to extreme heat under these different warming scenarios and time periods. Um, we also examined a few different combinations of work schedules, both normal and adjusted to cooler um, hours of the day, as well as physical workloads, so either moderate or lighter, to see how different adaptation policies could affect our results. Um, and then we use county level data uh, from the US Census on the number of workers in occupations for which two thirds or more of jobs require outdoor work. And we then use the projections of unsafe work days to look at the number of um, unsafe days each year in these different time periods, as well as the earnings that could be at risk of being lost as a result of extreme heat. Um, we did so for seven occupational categories, which I'll speak to in a moment. And we also looked at state level race and ethnicity data for each occupational category. So just to underscore what we really did here <laughs> is after all of this number crunching, um, we calculated the number of work days per year that could be at risk of being lost at mid-century and late century under these different global warming scenarios, as well as the associated earnings that um, could be at risk of being lost each year. And so just to take a moment to zoom in on who we're talking about in this analysis, um, we considered seven what we refer to as occupational categories. Um, and so these include construction and extraction jobs. So think the people who are building our homes, roofers, um, mining machine operators. Um, we looked at protective service. So that would be police officers and firefighters. We looked at farming, fishing and forestry workers. So those would be farm workers, forest conservation workers, 
Um, we considered material moving occupations. So that would be, for example, mechanics or people who work on our electric or telecommunication lines. Um, we looked at, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I think I didn't say, I think I just mixed two um, uh, occupational categories, forgive me. Materials moving, so that would be truck drivers and railroad workers, for example, and then installation maintenance and repair would be those mechanics, electric and uh, telecommunication lines workers, forgive me. Um, we also looked at building and grounds cleaning and maintenance workers. So that would be, for example, janitors or pest control workers, landscapers, um, and then finally transportation. And that could be people such as airfield operations specialists, um, delivery truck drivers. Um, and in this analysis, 83% of the individuals included identified as male, um, more than 40% identified as Black, African American, or Hispanic, um, or Latino, versus about 32% of the general public. Um, and there were a lot of variations in income relative to occupation, some earning more than the average job in the U.S. and some earning significantly less. And so what did we find? So some of the key national results that I wanted to walk through with you. And what I'm going to focus on here is a scenario in which workers are conducting a moderate workload um, at the typical time of day that they tend to work now, um, assuming no action on climate change and focusing on mostly our mid-century results relative to historical. So what we found is that each year, about 18.4 million outdoor workers experience at least a week's worth of unsafe work days, and again, in an average year, versus about three, I'm sorry, I should say, at mid-century, that's what we project, versus about 3 million workers historically. So again, that would be 15 million more outdoor workers would experience at least one week's worth of unsafe work conditions by mid-century if we don't take action on climate change. An incredible expansion. Um, we found that by mid-century, there could be $55.4 billion worth of outdoor worker earnings that could be at risk of being lost because of extreme heat relative to 9 billion annually. And at mid-century, there could be 17, or the average outdoor worker could be at risk of losing $1,700 worth of earnings relative to $240 um, because of extreme heat. So a really big increase. And that number is not equal across the country. So for example, when we looked at what could happen in the 10 hardest hit counties across the United States, we found that those workers would be at risk of losing about $7,000 per year because of extreme heat by mid-century. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, and we also found that individuals who identify as Hispanic, Latino, Black, or African American would be disproportionately expect, um, affected and could uh, see $23.5 billion of their earnings at risk of being lost because of extreme heat. And obviously, that would then intersect with other pre-existing inequalities resulting from systemic racism, you know, the unequal access to health care, for example. So all of these different issues would compound one another and really lead to those populations bearing a disproportionate brunt of this issue. Um, what I'm showing you here is the annual number of workdays that could be at risk of being lost by mid-century with no action on climate change. So you can see in yellow, that's about zero to one days per year on average, whereas um, increasing up to red is at uh, between 30 to 54 days per year that could be at risk of being lost because of extreme heat. So you can see parts of Florida in that hottest bucket um, where workers would be seeing on the upwards of one to two months worth of work days being too hot to work. Um, so some of the states with the highest number of work days at risk in total, um, Louisiana was number one with a state average of 34, 34 and Florida was a close second with 33. Um, and that's as compared with five days historically. Um, when we looked at what this would mean for workers and their earnings, we found that, um, so I'm showing you a map of the percent of annual earnings that could be at risk of being lost at mid-century with no action on climate change. You can see parts of Florida where outdoor workers would be looking at 
15 to 30% of their earnings being at risk of being lost because of extreme heat. Really, really remarkable. Um, so stepping back and um, kind of putting the picture together for Florida. Um, so Florida has about 2 million outdoor workers. Uh, about 23% of these workers work in construction and extraction occupations, and about 22% of them work in buildings and grounds cleaning and maintenance jobs. As I mentioned before, um, at mid-century with no action on climate change, workers across the state could see 33 days at risk of being lost per year versus five historically. Um, the state could see $8 billion worth of outdoor worker earnings at risk as a result of that unsafe work, work uh, excuse me, work time versus 1 billion historically. And the average outdoor worker in the state of Florida could see $3,700 um, worth of their earnings at risk of being lost by mid-century versus $520 annually. This uh, counties that we found would be hardest hit include Monroe, Collier and Pasco counties. Um, what we found is that, so we also have the ability, I should say, to look at things patient. Um, we found that the highest total earnings at risk um, was for construction and extraction workers in Florida, um, in which about $2 billion worth of earnings would be at risk of being lost by mid-century with no action, um, followed by installation and maintenance and repair workers who could see $1.6 billion of their earnings at risk. Um, the most earnings that would be at risk per worker would be for protective service workers who could see $5,000 worth of their earnings being at risk across the state on average, followed by installation maintenance and repair workers who could see about $4,800 at risk of being lost per year. So now I wanted to shift into, well, what do we do about this? Um, so what we're advocating for here are solutions in two buckets. So I've been saying, you know, we kind of need to be taking a one-two punch <laughs> at this issue in which we're on the one, at one hand, at one time, I should say, um, taking aggressive action on climate change right now to limit just how severe the increases in extreme heat could get. We need to reduce our heat trapping emissions. You know, so the United States must be making robust contributions to global climate action, including implementing just and equitable solutions that fulfill the commitments that have been made so far. Um, so, for example, the Biden administration's commitment to reducing net greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels in 2030. We need to get on track to do that so that when we look out the door, we see that our electricity is not being generated by fossil fuels, but that we're actually on track to make those kinds of commitments. Um, we need to be uh, investing in policies and measures that advance clean electricity, energy efficiency, zero emissions vehicles, mass transit. Um, we need to have as many sectors electrified as possible and also, also um, investments so that we have healthier soils and forests that can help take up carbon and store it. Um, and all of this, everything I'm mentioning has the potential to create jobs and help create um, just pathways for workers um, you know, to be able to get involved in this. We also at the same time need to enact worker protections right now. As I mentioned before, there's a lack of mandatory measures to keep workers safe in the face of extreme heat at the federal level and in every state except Washington and California. So in Florida, there is no state level policy. So yes, according to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, workers are, are required by law to provide a safe working environment, but that doesn't mean that they have specific directives on how to do that. There are no specific directives. And as a result, we see social media uh, or you can see on social media videos from, for example, United Farm Workers on what shade gets interpreted as. You see videos and you can check this out online of workers huddling under grapevines because that's considered shade. That's unacceptable. We shouldn't have in 2021 workers dying on the job because of heat stress. Um, so, you know, what we're talking about is enacting common sense basic human rights measures here. So passing the Asuncion Valdivia Heat Fatality and uh, Illness and Fatality Prevention Act. Um, it's a piece of legislation named after a farm worker from California who died 
on the job because he picked grapes in triple digit conditions for 10 hours straight, asked for help, didn't get it, and died in the car with his son on the way home. So this measure would re um, require that OSHA set a heat safety standard that would give employers those specific directives to take to prevent heat illness and heat deaths. Um, it would save lives and again, it would require common sense measures um, that would guarantee workers the right to take breaks, have ready access to shade and drinking water and acclimatization periods, really basic human rights. So um, in our uh, kind of bucket of resources that we have available from this report, um, we have the report itself um, and just that link at the bottom in yellow, you can find all of this. We have um, congressional district fact sheets where you can go in, you can find your congressional district and it'll um, spit out a one page, or I guess that's actually two page, but if you print it on one piece of paper, <laughs> um, fact sheet that you can take with you to meet with your representatives to advocate for the bill that I mentioned, as well as other measures to take action on climate change and keep workers safe from extreme heat. We have a short video that you can view about this issue, an interactive mapping tool that I'll talk about in a moment, as well as spreadsheets where you can download all the data that I uh, was up late at night generating. <laughs> um, we have an ongoing, ongoing blog series, um, as well as a peer review, a paper that's going through the peer review process right now. And anything that has an asterisk is available in both English and Spanish. So in terms of the interactive web tool um, that I'm going to just walk through a few examples. Um, so in this tool, you can find information on a number of different things at the county level. Um, so for example, um, if you go in, you can look up your county and find uh, information on the outdoor workforce statistics by county. So this is showing Okeechobee County in Florida. You can see the number of workers um, employed in outdoor occupations, how that you know compares to the general uh, workforce, what occupational categories they're employed in. You can go in and you can look at the work days per year that are at risk of being lost um, at the county level, how that compares with historical values and the earnings that, uh, associated with it. Um, you can go in and you can look at the benefits um, from reducing emissions or implementing the adaptation measures that I mentioned, shifting work schedules to cooler parts of days or lightening workloads. Um, you can also find state level demographic information for outdoor workers. Um, so you can see um, the number of workers uh, across the state who identify as, uh, for example, Hispanic or Latino and the portion of uh, different jobs that they work in. Um, I just wanted to flag a few limitations of this study um, and uh, you know, just be transparent about that. So for example, we were not able to include some important outdoor work jobs based on the nature of the data sets that were available. So unfortunately, we were not able to include mail carriers, nor were we able to include individuals who manage agricultural or construction enterprises. They were included in sort of these buckets that uh, were not, yeah, basically it was just a data limitation. Um, we also don't account for changes in population or migration or future automation of jobs. Um, and we're uh, using earnings values that are um, at 2017 adjusted inflation levels. So uh, we don't make projections in terms of how the economy could shift into the future. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you so much, uh, provide you with, again, a link to the study where you can find all the resources I mentioned, as well as my email address. Please always feel free to get in touch. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and really look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Licker. I'm actually, we have a, a raised hand. Uh, let me just... That it was Wanda. Wanda, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question to Dr. Licker. Uh, Wanda, Brian, you are, if you can unmute yourself, go ahead. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Oh, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thank well, I love to hear your voice. <laughs> hear the chorus of participants. <laughs> 
uh, does anyone have some a, a question for Dr. Licker or would anyone, I know we have several people uh, attending us today that aren't necessarily in Florida that have questions with regards to where they're located that maybe Dr. Licker can go into more detail with. Please feel free to use the, the chat or Q&A or raise your hand. I have Caroline. I'm going to be allowing Caroline to oh. talk. Okay. Hello, Rachel. Hello. Dr. Lickert, it's always so good to see you. Likewise. I do sleep better at night knowing that UCS have people like you mm -hmm. looking at issues like this at the granular level. My question is, all the good research you're doing based on predicted temperatures in, in worst case scenarios, best case scenarios, are, are we factoring feedback loops that truly indicate a worst case scenario that isn't often discussed in these IPCC reports? So what we, thank you so much, first of all, and I'm very humbled by your comment, thank you. Um, and it's always a pleasure to work with Cleo and the amazing things that you guys do. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and I, uh, so to that point, we are using the best available climate models, which um, uh, the downscale projections that we're working with are from um, the previous round of the IPCC models um, that, you know, are the new ones just, just, just came out. So they came out kind of too late for us to be able to use for this study. Uh, but that said, um, you know, we know that climate models are still, yeah, I mean, those those big surprises have the potential to um, push things to levels that um, we, uh, yeah, it, it could lead to surprises, some of those feedbacks. Um, the, so it's, so it's a little bit hard to answer that question. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Dr. Luker, sorry to interrupt. Maybe for someone in the audience that may not know what a feedback loop is. Could oh, you, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was going into like my climate narrative of just thinking of it. <laughs> um, okay, so what Caroline is um, is mentioning is that um, there can be um, uh, the potential for there to be uh, basically, you know, these um, situations in which you have um, permafrost melting and that creates a darker earth surface, which then more heat is being absorbed and it can kind of create these big feedback loops where all of a sudden we um, have the potential for um, unexpected large scale shifts in our climate um, that could lead to also things like, uh, you know, large sea level rise um, and yeah, sort of, um, sometimes they call them tipping points. Um, so there is some of that accounted for in the climate models that we're using, but um, I think it's recognized as somewhat of a limitation potentially. Perfect. Uh, I, I have Robert that also has a question. Robert, feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm, I'm watching from Salt Lake City. Cool. Um, my question is, did your model in include how the crops or other, other activities might migrate? So if they're harvesting tomatoes or strawberries or something, the, the range of tolerance for that might migrate north and the work would migrate with it. Great question, thank you. Um, we did not consider any um, might, you know, shifts in where different worker populations might be located um, just due to some of the complexities of that. Um, so in some respects, our projections could be seen as being conservative because we don't have, you know, the potential for populations to, um, you know, grow and expand. Um, you know, in some cases they could be, um, uh, you know, if there was a shift away from hot areas, we wouldn't be capturing that. Um, but, you know, what we're really trying to underscore here is the potential for you know, our present day populations to, uh, you know, the risks that they could be uh, um, exposed to so that we have the potential to foresee these issues and take the levels of action that we need to, to prevent the extreme heat increases and also protect workers. Um, so yeah, so in some respects, it could be conservative in some respects, you know, there are things that we might not be capturing here. 
Great question, though. Uh, another attendee. Oh, Robert, go ahead. Uh, Robert, you can unmute yourself. There you go. If um, if there's no one else, I have a, a follow up on that. Um, Please feel free. So in Utah, we're we're getting very familiar with air quality index advisories. Um, our valleys are prone to pollution that's generated here locally, and and the smoke from the fires in the west also accumulates in our valleys. So the AQI is a very familiar metric for working outdoors or being outdoors. Um, the heat index is less familiar. What's being done to make that bring that to people's attention where, you know what, better not do this activity today, it's dangerous. Yeah, that is one of the things that we are advocating for in our report. Um, if you visit the website that I referred to, there is a section um, in the report on policy recommendations where we do talk about that, the need for an improved heat advisory alert system across the country, you know, obviously specifically also for employers and workers so that they are aware of unsafe work conditions. Um, but in general, that is something that we've heard, you know, come up at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, that houses the National Weather Service. So I think under the Biden administration, there's interest in improving some of this and how these um, heat hazards get communicated. Um, because I should say also heat is the, uh, it's one of weather related causes of death in the United States, even outside of the occupational settings. This is relevant to everyone across the country. Um, yeah, so it's really something that we need to be improving. Um, and you know, it's really funny that you say that because I just yesterday was having a conversation with a neighbor on the flip side where here in the Midwest, we actually don't hear about the AQI on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so there was actually a month where almost every day there were unsafe, um, uh, there were unsafe values and no one knew about it because it's not something that people are accustomed to looking into and we just don't have that information dispersal so people were playing outside with their kids exercising biking around having no idea that actually the wildfire smoke from canada and out west was making it unsafe here mm -hmm. and so i think you know with climate change things are changing at such a fast pace for so many places we're encountering hazards that were not um, you know, necessarily accustomed to. And so it's, you know, we really need to be rethinking um, all of these kinds of things so that we can keep people safe and utilize the technologies that we have on hand and our cell phones, for example, to get this information to people in real time. That's an excellent answer. I have Caroline, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, I was just wondering if, if Dr. Lickett was aware of the Atlantic Council effort to start naming heat waves? Um, and what do you think of that? Yeah, that's a really great question. I, I was just racking my brain if I had heard of that. I've heard about it for other extreme events, that idea. And I think, I mean, this is just a gut reaction, you know, um, my gut reaction is that I think that that would be really powerful because I think it provides a useful reference point for people to, first of all, look back and we'd be able to assess um, what has happened, you know, and, and we have this kind of common reference point. The name helps us collectively kind of remember what the event was and what it entailed. Um, and sort of set boundaries around it so that we can assess the damages. But then that's retrospective. In terms of dealing in the present moment, you know, I think that it helps sort of, um, there's something about the human psyche that when we name events and storms, um, it helps to kind of, yeah, again, create this sort of structure so people know what to do. Like this is what's happening and it's a concrete thing that you need to be dealing with. Um, so it's not just, it's gonna be hot outside. It, it kind of underscores the severities that we needed to name this because it's severe. <laughs> and there's something that you need to be doing because this is happening to you. And I think giving it a name kind of folds that 
um, that circumstance. So that's my gut reaction. I would obviously welcome and love other thoughts and, you know, hearing the flip side if I'm wrong in those gut reactions. <laughs> no, I think you have, a, you have a great point. You know, Hurricane Andrew hit Miami, where I live, in 1992. And that is my reference point for everything. That the first main storm in the 1992 season was in August, first and foremost. That it was Andrew that it was a dry storm. It wasn't so wet because it moved so quickly and the devastation that it brought. So everything that has happened since 92, I'm not alone in referencing Andrew. So I do think naming the heat waves will do exactly what your gut says it will do. So thank you for that. Yeah, my pleasure. I, I definitely agree. I, you know, you don't hear about it as much. And even as um, as individuals, I, I have my my family here, my husband's mother and father, they're older, and they were walking and doing exercise the other day. And it was it, it felt like close to 100 degrees and they weren't drinking enough water. And my husband got very concerned about them at the end of the day. Uh, the reality is that, you know, naming heat waves does merit looking into it. Do you have any idea how we could go about that, Dr. Licker? Um, great question. Um, there are some efforts. Um, I was actually participating for some time through something called the American Meteorological Society, which is the professional society for meteorologists and, uh, and climatologists are also part of it too, um, where there was an effort to reconsider some of that. Um, and so I think, you know, first of all, contacting your elected representatives to express that idea and share that idea, uh, because ultimately, you know, those, um, those initiatives uh, are, you know, done by our National Weather Service. Um, and so uh, expressing a preference for that to happen or um, pushing on them to encourage that. Um, is I think one really important way um, where they uh, are involved with overseeing the, um, you know, they have the oversight of those agencies under their jurisdiction. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, Robert, I wasn't sure if you had another question, um, just in case I'll allow you to talk because I saw your hand up. No, I'm oh. sorry, I didn't realize my hand Went back down. <laughs> no worries. Uh, let me see if Caroline, do you have another question or your hand was up? No, sorry. I think there are some questions in the chat and in the q and I do see one in the chat. Um, it's from Ernie. Ernie, would you like me to unmute you or would you like me to read you your question? I'm allowing you just in case. Mm -hmm. All right, Ernie has a question. It says, um, I have a question, but first forgive me my outburst caused by my own nostalgia. My symptoms include an underlying sense of loss, vague sensation of being torn from the earth, a general out of placeness, homelessness without leaving home. I felt it without knowing. What was it? So here is my outburst is Greta Joan of Arc Thunberg, the maid of Sweden said, let's see how it plays out or was it Genesis Khan said, let's see how it plays out. Here's my question. Can you address this definitive disease of the 21st century? Um, so definitive disease being the underlying sense of loss and the vague sense of being torn from earth. Is, is that the, the disease that, that you're referencing? I'm gonna go with that assumption. <laughs> um, what I'm guessing you might be referring to is this sort of bizarre um, uh, experience with seeing your home become un unrecognizable because of climate change. Um, I personally, I just have been so startled by, um, I actually lived in the Midwest for a long time. I, I moved out East for work for some time and came back and I was shocked at how winter had changed in the seven years that I was gone, um, how all of a sudden wildfire smoke from Western large wildfires is now a significant problem. Um, you know, how we're having heat, you know, this late in the summer to a level that's just kind of not, you know, typically where we're at. Um, and 
it creates all of these changes in our rhythms, in our, you know, sort of markers for the year and our sense of ourselves in our places. Um, and it's something that a lot of professionals in the climate change field talk about is this experience of grief, um, where you feel like you're experiencing all of these losses. Um, and, you know, in concert with this feeling of what can I do about it? And I think that, um, you know, obviously COVID and the isolation that that's brought about kind of is underscoring that experience probably also for a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I would encourage you to, you know, in being um, involved in webinars like this or, you know, the activities that we're talking about, um, I think being active in it can really help um, because it can kind of um, at least, you know, you're experiencing the losses and then there can be the feeling of helplessness, at least it can kind of get at part of it. Um, so I think that for me, I, you know, people often ask how I can do this line of work, but, you know, I get to do something every day about this issue. And so that really helps deal with it. And you can find connections with other people who care. So it can help you feel sane and grounded as in such a sort of disorienting world that we're living in. That's an excellent point. Ernie, for, for me, uh, working in this in this field, uh, you know, I'm a mom. I have a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old, and it, it can be devastating. But the reality is that what we should be feeling, and I'll quote Caroline in this, is rage. We should be so angry because the reality is that the solutions exist. It's just a matter of political will to do this and do this with urgency. If we've learned anything from the IPCC report is that we can't keep kicking the can down the road and expecting a, a generation that comes behind us to, to somehow miraculously solve this issue for us. The reality is that we have the power to make a difference. We have the power as voters to be civically engaged, not just in major presidential elections, but contacting our local commissioners, contacting our mayors, you know, engaging in our local and state politics is incredibly important. The other one we don't do enough of, we don't talk about this issue enough. Uh, with our friends, with our family, and talk about it in a way where we find common ground. I know on my end, my family, I'm a mix of, you know, both political aisles. And the, the, the key was really for me being able to find common ground and, and talking to those members in my family that maybe weren't as um, educated or didn't care so much about this issue bring them in and talk to them about their loved ones, anyone under the age of 30, what, what their future really looks like and the legacy that we're really leaving behind. And then to Rachel's point, you know, getting more involved in these kinds of, of discussions and, and just continuing to join, um, to join that power of the movement. There's, there's a quote, and I, I won't say it quite the right way, but you, all, you don't need 100% of the population to enact change. You need about 3.5% of it. So we really don't need everybody on board. We just need a 3.5% a, a three, 3 really loud <laughs> to make a difference. So, you know, it really comes down to civic engagement and communication, talking to others. Uh, we all, uh, once uh, we end, I'm going to share with you a, a really amazing program that I really invite every one of you to join. I myself, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a teacher. I was an entrepreneur and an inventor of children's products. And when I took a climate lecture with the Clio Institute, I went from zero to a hundred. Um, I certified myself as a climate speaker, and I can say I myself have given a climate presentation to over a thousand people, and there's a ripple effect with that. And so, you know, there really are a lot of avenues that we can take because we shouldn't feel uh, um, lost. Quite frankly, we need our target. We have our target eye on the bullseye, uh, and and really, you know, know that we should use this these emotions to empower us with with anger, quite frankly. Um, let me see, we have another Caroline. <laughs> 
No, um, that was an accident. I really, I really appreciate this conversation. I do think it's going to take, you know, people like Dr. Leckett standing up and, and, and just giving us the facts, the number of days that it's going to be hard for us to be outside, much less work outside, is only going to increase. And I guess if I have a question for you, it would be, we have probably the biggest problem at Clio communicating to people why two degrees average increase in global temperature is such a big deal. That it's not the same as saying, well, I woke up this morning and it was 75 degrees and now it's 88 and I'm okay. So what is two degrees going to do with three degrees? And giving people perspective on that global average and what those little changes mean, not as easy as it should be. Could you help? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the analogy with having a fever is really helpful and saying, you know, with people understanding, you know, if your body temperature increases by a few degrees Fahrenheit um, and a couple of degrees Celsius, we know what that means. That means a range of symptoms across our body. And it is exactly the same for the earth. And that's why when we have a two degree Celsius increase in the earth's average temperature, it translates into these huge increases in extreme heat during the warm season across the United States. And then translates into unsafe work conditions at staggering levels for outdoor workers and other people. It translates into earnings losses. It is, um, you know, it's akin to having a fever and the ramifications mean changes in our daily experiences and to a level where things could become unrecognizable. Yeah, very true. Do we have any more questions from the audience out of curiosity? Have you studied the effect of climate change on crop growth and quality? I have. I did my dissertation on it. <laughs> yeah, I actually looked at how um, I, this is very, so, you know, when you do a PhD, you do something very specific. So I was looking at the effect of climate change on wheat growth in Eastern and Western Europe. And I was looking at, um, yeah, how droughts and increasing temperatures are affecting things. Um, beyond Eastern and Western Europe, here in the United States, we know that uh, extreme heat is a big deal for crop yields, crop quality, um, not just the um, maximum daily temperature, but also increases in the nighttime temperatures. Um, you know, we know that when temperatures go beyond 90 degrees Fahrenheit, for example, it can really start to reduce crop yields for important crops like corn, you know, which is grown across the country and used in many of our different products. So it's a big deal. Um, and, you know, we're already seeing effects um, in different parts of the country and it's projected to get um, increasingly severe and implications also, yes, for the quality of the products as well. Definitely. I've also heard that the, the nutrients levels actually exactly. being impacted by the absorption, mm -hmm. absorption of carbon dioxide. I have another question uh, from anonymous attendee. National Weather Service does not take into consideration urban heat island effect when issuing heat advisories. Research suggests it could be 10 to 15 degrees above in some cases in some urban areas. Is there opportunity with this report for advocacy to change that? Utilities normally follow that to stop power disconnections, which sometimes can be life-threatening. Excellent point. Yeah, that's a really, really great point. Um, and it, it's something that, um, you know, there are a lot of, um, other sort of like ripple on effects where you have the urban heat island effect and then you can have um, more ground level ozone pollution. And you know, if you have the dirtier power plants being brought online in these areas uh, during these heat, extreme heat events, it can exacerbate that ozone and other sort of air quality problems. Um, so it's a really, really great point. And it's something that, um, yeah, is, is it, we definitely are trying to speak to the, um, unique risk to urban populations um, and is something that, you know, when we're all talking about this issue, I think is really critical as well. Yeah, that's an excellent point. 
Uh, we have time for one more question or two more questions if anyone would like to either use the Q&A and or the chat. Okay, so before we uh, head on out, I did want to share um, before we go. Always start with a conversation. The power of communication is incredible. Uh, as Dr. Catherine Hayhoe has said, this is one of the easiest solutions we can all start doing today. Look into efficiency. Where can you reduce your waste? And switch to a low carbon alternative whenever possible. And continue to grow with us because even though you know a lot about this already, there's always room for more. So we welcome you to come and join us for our monthly webinars to join us for our Clio Speakers Network and to support our Gen Clio Youth Movement, who is hosting a Climate Day of Action on September 24th. And this is our Clio Speakers Network. It's our last cohort for the year. Uh, it's developed for students and professionals, so it, it's quick and easy. It's uh, about four days, uh, and each one is about a two-hour time slot that you dedicate to this. We share all of our slides. We pair you with a coach. We get you comfortable talking about the climate science impacts and solutions. Uh, it's a great program that you can do whether you want to take your show on the road and do a climate presentation for your place of worship, your business, or just because you want to be able to have better conversations with your friends and family. And also, please don't forget to follow us at the Clio Institute, both Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok. Uh, that's one of the best ways to get to know us and to be up and, uh, you know, up to stay up to date on our webinars and our programs. Um, I have a comment from Karen. I certified as a Clio climate speaker just before COVID, and I have not been in contact with you about how to work with it now. Please put me in touch with your staff. Of course, uh, let me actually give you my email address uh, so that you can reach out to me. And I can put you in contact with our, our program manager for the Clio Speakers Network. Is there anything else? Uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline Edmund to Vancouver must get insurance. This is a, more of a comment and a link. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thank you, Dr. Licker, for spending the afternoon with us at Clio. This is being recorded, and we will be sharing it with everyone. Uh, so if you would like to share this recording with friends and, and family, we will be sending you the link. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And please also follow Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you.